morning. I'm Media Relations Director Sherry Babinski, and we're here to talk about the return to face-to-face -face instruction, which begins on Friday. Uh, with us today is School Board Chair Teresa Jacobs, District 1 School Board Member Angie Gallo, and Superintendent Barbara Jenkins. Senior Director of Transportation, Bill Wen, Senior Director of Food and Nutrition Services, Laura Gilbert, and Director of Custodial Services, Kevin Ballinger. We're going to begin with School Board Chair, Teresa Jacobs. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you all so much for, for being here today to help us with what's probably one of the most difficult challenges that, that we face um, throughout this epidemic and that's adequately uh, communicating with the public what we're doing why we're doing it how we're doing it so we appreciate you being here to help us with that message i also want to take just a minute to thank our parents our teachers our administrators our principals everyone who has taken so much time over the last couple of months to provide us with a lot of input and feedback the board um, has certainly spent an enormous amount of time over the last several weeks trying to make difficult decisions with a con very constrained environment um, as most of you know the governor has given us um, um, through his Commissioner of Education in order that we must open all of our schools brick and mortar by the end of this month. We are ready. We are going to open our schools on Friday. Not the easiest decision we ever made. Um, not a unanimous decision, but um, I'm very proud of the board that I serve with that we all come to the table every meeting with one goal in mind, and that is to make our schools the best they can be for our students, our faculty, and everyone involved. And we leave the table after every meeting, regardless of whether we agree on every issue, with that same goal and camaraderie. So our board is united on making our schools as safe as we can, supporting our children, supporting our faculty, and we're united in supporting our superintendent, who has an enormous job uh, ahead of her, and that is working with over 200 schools and over 200,000 students, the eighth largest district in the nation, to do our absolute best to ensure the safety and the health of everyone who interacts with Orange County Public Schools. Now let me introduce our superintendent, Dr. Barbara Jenkins, so that she can fill you in on the details of how school is going to operate beginning on Friday. Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Jacobs, and thanks uh, as well to all of you for being here. I have to say, our school board, uh, eight women, have done an incredible job. A highly emotional issue for this community, certainly intense, uh, both for our employees and for our parents. And I just want to say publicly again how much my administration appreciates the diligence of our school board, uh, listening to hours of public testimony and agonizing through the decisions around how and when we open schools. I greatly appreciate the partnership I have with a phenomenal group of women who have uh, led this district at a governmental level. So let me mention just a few things that folks might be curious about, and I want to note that on Thursday, tomorrow, our work session is going to drill down into the life, uh, a day in the life of a student in OCPS. That's what the presentation will be around, and that will also be pushed out to all of our parents so they can be familiar with that resource as well. Lots of details that I won't go into now, but a day in the life of an OCPS student. Stay tuned for that release tomorrow. It's the first time since March 13th that our schools will uh, be open full scale once again. I want to emphasize, uh, and our board asked that I be sure to emphasize this, because we know about a third of our parents have selected to be in the face-to-face -face setting for their education, that does not mean parents can expect each classroom to be about one-third full. That is not the case. We have several teachers that will be teaching from home. We have several teachers that will be in the school setting, but there are good chances in several instances that the school classes will still be close to normal capacity. What, what is different, and I I know we'll have a pool camera to go and actually look in one of the classrooms here, is that excess furniture is to be removed, has been removed from classrooms so that they can space as far as possible those students in their classrooms. Uh, three to six feet is what the state has uh, in general said, well the state says as much as feasible. We've tried to hit between the three and six foot margin. Because of that, we are also requiring face masks in the classrooms to keep our students and our teachers safe. I think it's important to note, though, 
classes are not going to be one-third large because our students don't come in those neat little packages. It just varies from classroom to classroom. Many of our classrooms will be close to normal capacity. Also need to uh, emphasize those parents whose students are enrolled in VPK, that is regular VPK, voluntary pre-kindergarten sponsored by the state. Uh, the uh, decision from the state level is that those classes are all to be face-to-face -face, uh, beginning August 21st. So there is, uh, come August 21st, there is no option for voluntary pre-K to be at home. They are only offered in face-to-face. So opening schools amidst a pandemic. It's been 100 years since we've been in this predicament. I want to start by also thanking our amazing teachers, our classified support staff, our principals and assistant principals who have been working diligently to prepare us as much as possible for this opening, getting ready for our students. Do you remember the first nine days were on Launch Ed? That is our platform where students are still connected to their classroom teachers during the regular school day. I'd like to note that over 5,000 of our students will be on Orange County Virtual School. That platform does not have required seat time. It's a course completion requirement where students may be working evenings, weekends, weekends and beyond to complete their coursework. So for Launch Ed, it's important to note that dry run, uh, those instructional days also provide uh, preparation to our students and teachers because that is our pivot when we have to, should we have to switch from being face-to-face -face in particular classrooms to at-home instruction due to an instance of a COVID case or any other emergency for that matter, hurricane for example, then they are prepared to pivot. So let's talk about um, the brick and mortar. I want to highlight a few of uh, the personal protective equipment uh, provisions here on the table. Uh, we had a question, someone was asking about the quality of the face masks. Several of them were actually provided by the state. They do meet the CDC guidelines. Um, we have uh, face masks for teachers and for students. I know many of our employees prefer to wear their own face mask as long as it meets the requirements. And many of our students come with their own face masks as well. We will have available face masks for students who do not have them uh, available or do not come with a face mask. In fact, starting at the bus stop, students have to have on a face mask. The bus drivers have some disposable face masks available for children as they get on the bus and use that hand sanitizer pump uh, and then move to their seats. So uh, everything here on the table, teachers will have face masks as well as face shields. Uh, it, many of you were taking pictures of them uh, previously. Those are provided for our teachers. Um, we also have hand sanitizers and cleaning wipes available in all of our schools. And for teachers who deal with uh, medically fragile students or students who may have some additional special needs, we also have gown disposable gowns and gloves for those individuals. Let's talk about uh, arrival and dismissal. I'm sorry, and I've neglected to mention there are the handheld um, thermometers as well for periodic temperature checks. Upon arrival, uh, we will have a dispersing of staff around campus to make sure students are equally distanced apart. Need to mention once again, at the bus stop, we depend on parents and students. They need to be socially distanced at the bus stop while they are waiting on the bus. Then they will enter the bus and load from the back to the front. Bus drivers will assist with that. Uh, our numbers are way down, so we won't have uh, buses as crowded as they have typically been. There will be far fewer students on the bus. They will load from the back to the front, and as they get off the bus, they will exit from the front to the back to limit passing among other students. I would also mention for hand washing and sanitizing, that is expected on a regular basis, especially when students leave or re-enter the classroom. So consider recess time, lunches, other times they have to leave and re-enter the classroom. Hand washing and sanitizing is expected. There's also, uh, throughout the schools, strategic signage placed to reinforce health and safety protocols at each campus. Students are, uh, and this question has come up as well, and the board will continue to have discussions. Students are required to wear a mask or face coverings unless they have a medical exemption. Non-essential non visitors and parents will be limited. We're asking parents not to try to visit the school other than dropping their children off. First day of school for kindergarten parents especially usually means walking your child to the classroom. We cannot 
allow that this year. We need you to drop your children off and not have any additional visitors uh, on campus. It's a different opening than we've had in the past, and I am so sorry to those parents who were excited about that first day of kindergarten that essentially we ask you to drop your children and not try to walk them to class. Um, we also will certainly have management of departure so that students are spaced apart, car riders and walkers as they exit the school. Throughout the day, we are uh, insisting and encouraging students to maintain social distancing. In classroom, they will be seated physically distant. The layout in the classrooms you will see, the pool camera will see in uh, just a few moments here. Chairs and desks and workstations placed apart as much as possible and facing as much as possible in the same direction. I'd also like to mention our OCPS COVID-19 Health and Safety Procedures Manual has more details, 76 pages worth of detail uh, that our medical advisory uh, committee is going to review with us, as has the Department of Health uh, reviewed with us as well. I would like to end by, before I bring on some of our logistics uh, folks on the operations side of the house, I would just like to end by saying we have done as much as we believe possible to have safe settings for our students. Do we have a 100% guarantee that there will not be a single case? Absolutely not. Because the chances are those who are entering the school may actually uh, be COVID positive and not even know it. So what we have in place instead is as many safety precautions as possible in all of our schools. And then we have procedures in place and being worked through to make sure when a case is determined that it is handled rapidly and appropriately. We will make those flow charts available as well once they are, are reviewed uh, tonight by our medical advisory committee. Uh, Department of Health has helped us create those flow charts as well. So Quite often, people make assumptions that if there is a case, the entire school should be shut down, and that is not usually the case. So there's six different flow charts, just so you know how um, intense the Department of Health has been in helping us. There's six different flow charts around a child who is symptomatic versus someone who's been tested positive versus someone who is uh, not feeling well and may actually be suffering from something else besides COVID-19. So all of that detail, we are being as transparent as possible, those flow charts six of them uh, we will make available, in fact, uh, as the Medical Advisory Committee reviews them today. I think it goes without saying, I've talked with my colleagues, other superintendents across the state as well as across the country, um, the, matter in which, the manner in which we manage those cases is probably most important at this point uh, because it's inevitable that there will be cases. We are just preparing to handle them efficiently. That being said, folks are very curious about custodial services and what is different, what is additional uh, when it comes to cleaning our schools. I'm going to ask Kevin Ballinger to come to the podium and talk a bit about custodial services. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. For years, our custodians have worked, worked very hard to make sure that our policies and procedures combat any type of bacterial outbreaks. That could be an influenza or any other substance or problems that we would have in our schools. This pandemic is a little different, so we're doing some things differently. First of all, we started with reviewing our processes to make sure the procedures we currently have in place can create sustainable processes to keep our, our schools clean and disinfected on a more regular basis. All of our cleaning and disinfecting products were verified from EPA and CDC to make sure they're in compliance. We also use the electrostatic sprayer and other types of sprayers in our schools, which you've seen, and this is one on the table, it's small, it's compact, but it allows you to disinfect an area more effectively throughout a shorter period of time and less manpower. We plan to do that after the end of the school day and any time during the day that we have a long period of time when children are not occupying a space when we can successfully do it and not cause any residue to be on a surface after when they come back in, that's going to be our regular practice. These are some of the things we've increased to make sure that we're, make, we're doing something different than we have in the past. We have supplemented our, our custodial staff with temp labor in some of the schools. 
That is to allow more people walking around all day long hitting those high touch points. We want to make sure as they touch a doorknob, we're checking and wiping doorknobs. We're, touching light, we're checking light switches and, and wiping those off, pencil sharpeners, anything else we can do not to affect the educational day, but to make sure that it's as safe as it possibly can be from the custodial staff. We also adjusted our custodial work hours. Uh, we used to have custodians that came in, one, one or two people came in the morning and majority came in the evening when no one was there to clean, no one was in spaces so we could more effectively clean. But now we brought everyone in during the daytime so that all day long we're going to be cleaning and disinfecting every space that we possibly can, any areas that are trans, uh, transited by our children to make sure we stay on top of the disinfecting process and try to minimize any outbreaks. We have overstocked all our supplies in the schools on the custodial side. Anything that pertains to cleaning, disinfecting, restroom supplies, um, hand soap, which we know is going to be an increased usage in the schools. So we have overstocked that by 150% to make sure we're going to stay on top and make sure the children always can multi multiple times wash their hands. As we know, washing your hands is going to be more effective than anything else that we do in those schools. And overall, the custodians have worked very hard to make sure this is a clean and, work and safe working environment for our children and our teachers. We have processes in place also if a teacher walks out of a classroom and that classroom is going to be vacant or they're not coming back for the day, they have a sign. They switch that sign over from the green side, meaning everything was okay, to red, we need to disinfect. And our guys have, will go into a team, teammanship at one time and go through that classroom or multiple classrooms to make sure we're cleaning and disinfecting. And after that, I will like to introduce our Senior Director of Transportation, Bill Wynn. Thank you, Kevin. Preparation for this school year has been much different than previous years. And we've actually started back in March when this began, when schools were closed, working with other school districts in the state and also districts nationwide to find what are some of the best practices will be, because we're all in this together, and to share ideas and thoughts. So the start of the school year is going to look a whole lot different from a transportation perspective. As Dr. Jenkins said, face masks will be required to ride the bus for everyone's protection. And all of our employees will have protect, personal protective equipment as well. Those who are working with students with special needs will have face shields and we'll have face coverings, face masks for drivers, and also we'll have disposable face masks for any student who does not have one at the bus stop. As I said, we're all in this together. We ask that parents please work with your students to practice social distancing while at the bus stop, also while in the schools. Um, hand sanitizer dispensers have been mounted on all buses at the entranceway, so students can use them as they enter and exit the bus as well. Um, we're going to assign seats, as Dr. Jenkins said, where the first student will take a seat in the rear of the bus and the last student will sit in the front. This will minimize the, the times that students will pass each other in the aisles of the bus. And at the schools, we'll be working with staff to allow the student who gets off last to board first so they'll be in the back of the bus in their seat without having to pass each other. We've also reduced the capacity on our buses to no more than one student per seat maximum. Uh, we're routed toward those who have registered for face-to-face and that ask for transportation. And again, to minimize contact, we are encouraging parents who can transport their students to school in their personal vehicles to minimize the contact. We'll also improve the ventilations within the vehicles as well. We're going to open the vents on the roof vents to draw air in and to draw air out, and partially open some of the windows, select windows, again, to improve the ventilation within the vehicle. Uh, the air conditioners will be working. But with the select windows open and the vent, the bus will still remain cool inside. We will follow CDC recommendations to sanitize and disinfect the buses. Our drivers have been supplied with disinfectant and towels to mist the, the seats after every trip. So when they drop off students at the school, they will pull over within the bus loop with the disinfectant that we have and spray the seats, the window sills, and under the seats, and also wipe down the high touch areas up front, the handrails and the doors as well. And we have a bus outside if later on, if you wish to take a look, uh, you can see the things that we've brought onto the bus to do so. When the buses return in the morning and afternoons, and drivers have been provided time to do a more thorough cleaning and wipe down. 
They're, they're given time to wipe down the seats, the seat belts, the window sills, and uh, other high touch areas around the bus as well. So this will be done after the morning runs and also after the PM runs. And when the buses go through inspections every 30 days, they too will be disinfected with the electrostatic sprayer uh, when they're done as well. A couple things that uh, we do every school year that we ask for parents' support to help. Uh, please have your students at the designated bus stop within five or 10 minutes before the scheduled arrival time. So that way they'll be there when the bus arrives. For the elementary students who are riding the bus, please have them ride the bus to school and ride the bus home. That way they'll know where the bus stop is and where the home is when they get to their bus stop and know which bus to get on as well. Also inside their backpacks, please have your emergency contact information there as well. Uh, the bus route number, your name and phone number, so in the event the child is lost or forgets, we'll have information to find them and to reach you so that we can get them home to you safely. And again, most importantly with elementary students, let them ride the bus to school if they're, if they're registered to ride so they'll know where to get on, which, which bus driver to look for, and then when they get off the bus, they'll know where they are. So those are some of the changes, again, as we've done for preparations for this upcoming school year. Next, I'd like to introduce Senior Director Laura Gilbert of Food and Nutritional Services, where she'll talk about the health and safety procedures in our cafeterias. Thank you. Thank you. During the school year, the Food and Nutrition Services Program ensures that all students have access to healthy and nutritious meals, great tasting meals. And how do I know this? Because we always put it to the test. Unless every entree item uh, passes the test for the student taste test, it doesn't go on to the menu. And that's a pretty tough audience. So what I want to assure you is that we will be providing meals on every Monday afternoon, 30 minutes after the last bell, for all of the Launch Ed and the Orange County Virtual School students. The meals start 30 minutes after the last bell at that school. So if parents are running a little bit late, I would recommend that they go to a middle school because those curbside distribution sites are always open until about 6 o'clock. Students can pick up at any school, but they do need to carry their ID. We have a very efficient way. Sometimes you just need to write the student's ID in a large sheet of paper and show that to us, or we can scan them in at every point of sale. Now we're moving back to our normal food service program. While in the summer program, all meals were available at no charge. During the National School Lunch Program starting now, all students will need an application, a free and reduced application, in order to get the meals at no charge. If a parent has, has experienced an interruption in their salary or they're not getting an income, we would encourage them to go to mymealapps.com on our website and fill out an application. If they're already receiving federal benefits, such as the SNAP program, they already qualify and they don't have to fill out an application. We also have community eligibility schools, and those schools are in an area that has proved to be highly economically challenged, and none of the school students in the CEP schools are charged for their meals. Now, one of the things that you'll see is uh, a little bit differently is when students come back face to face is that breakfast will be served in a grab and go style. So they'll simply pass by a kiosk, make their selection and go to their assigned area to eat their meal. For lunch, we have streamlined the menus so that we can speed up the lines and the students can actually stand in the line where their entree is being served. So they'll simply go through, pick up the entree, and a side dish and uh, you can see there that we have invested in a hinged compartment that closes and locks so that after a student has passed by the serving line they can easily transport that to their assigned seating area. Once they're seated we have an alcohol wipe and you'll see that over there. We're putting two in every breakfast and two, two in every lunch so that when the child is seated 
and they open their lunch, they can take the alcohol wipe and wash their hands and then place that aside, take their mask off, and then eat their meal. At the end, they can use another alcohol wipe and sanitize their hands, close their meal, and take it to the trash area. So I'm really excited to tell you that we are still cooking from scratch. And you'll see some of the items over here, the chicken and broccoli. We've got a sofrito drumstick that is very popular with the students and a grilled chicken salad. We've got some amazing side dishes that we've tested with kids. You know, vegetables don't always go over well with kids, but we've tested it and the recipe has been standardized so that we know that these are the side dishes that the students enjoy. So we hope that they'll enjoy their meals at school this year. We have done several things to make them safer and as always, they're healthy. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. We will open it up to questions now. So what OCPS has uh, currently are those six flow charts that we've worked with the Department of Health on. The easiest answer is the Department of Health will consult with us on any case and help us make a determination on who has to be communicated with on the contact tracing and on any shutdowns. Department of Health strongly will be involved, engaged in those recommendations. No, our local, I'm sorry, our local Department of Health, Dr. Pino and his team. So Dr. Pino has said um, they have a capacity issue as they're able to provide testing for children that he will make OCPS a priority. Uh, where we are in that timeline, I'd have to have him respond to. Uh, but certainly uh, our medical advisory committee also recommended if you're able to rapidly test a student who may be um, at least displaying some symptoms that would be helpful in making sure you don't uh, quarantine a class uh, unnecessarily. So we're, we're waiting for that from uh, Dr. Pino. So we are actually, the state does not require reduced class size. In fact, um, they go by class size averages. So there are a couple of different strategies. One, you could limit the number of teachers who are actually going to be instructing from home and make uh, have more teachers in the school, or in some instances have teachers, and this is the case in some instances, where a teacher has a portion of their class in person and a portion at home. Uh, that can lower class size. That is the case in some instances. We do have to try to accommodate uh, all of our teachers who have have um, medical accommodations for working from home, and so that complicates matters. Uh, I wish the puzzle were simpler, but it's a bit complicated. Medical accommodations and those who need to work from home, as well as those who've asked uh, and expressed a preference for working at home, we've tried to accommodate in large numbers. And so um, it, it remains to be seen when the dust settles and when we have parents who've made some uh, changes in their selection uh, that we may have more teachers in the school setting and creatively be able to continually drive down class size. That first uh, week or so will be fluid. No, we do not know. Dr. Pino is uh, trying to get resources, but at this point we do not have rapid tests for all of our students. So I can't, I can't quote that for you. We'll certainly see what we can get for you because they're still changing today. We have changes being made today. And how do the 
So there's technology available. Some of our teachers have used it in the past. You've heard about cameras. Swivel cameras is just one brand. That's one uh, actual tool that our, our teachers can use. It gives them the ability to move around the classroom and still be on camera with those students that are at home. So our teachers are creative enough. We don't have to mandate who gets priority. I think they are quite capable of managing interaction among their students. So let me be clear. So Orange County Virtual School or Florida Virtual School has a, an ability to place more students in their classes. For our launch ed, we are still required to, at least on average, come to the class size requirements. But for virtual school, Orange County Virtual School, teachers uh, have normally, this is not new, teachers have normally been able to host larger numbers of students. And again, that uh, OCVS platform is where uh, both students and teachers have quite a bit of flexibility of when they complete the course as opposed to actual seat time. So we've had a few parents who have contacted their schools saying, I want to change my selection. If they have extenuating circumstances and really need to make that change, um, principals have tried to accommodate them. What is difficult about that is then you also have to shift your teachers. A teacher who was expecting to work from home then may need to be called in to actually work from school instead. And so we hope those are few and far between, but we do know of instances where parents have asked to make a change. Let me... Let me go over here for one second. He's been, he's been waving his hand for a while. Go ahead. So I cannot guarantee 100% safety. I think you can see uh, across this nation what happens when you open schools again. I don't believe anyone is uh, purporting that they have 100% guarantee. We believe we have processes in place to make it as safe as possible for our children, and then we have procedures in place um, around how to manage cases when they appear. Thank you. Dr. that was kind of my question. Um, that's a realistic view that you have. You're, you're not making guarantees. Why? Because you, we can't. We're in a pandemic. And so the chances are um, people that will enter our schools may already actually have the virus and not know it. I can't guarantee that. Pandemics actually uh, present challenges that even the medical community has not entirely figured out. And so to pretend that we've got a fail-proof measure and there will never be a case or never an instance to deal with in the school setting is just not realistic. I think it's inevitable. And we've said from the very beginning, we encourage parents uh, to consider the launch ed if it worked for their families, because that probably is the safest venue that you might uh, choose. If you need the face-to-face -face version, we are absolutely going to do everything in our power to make sure children and staff are safe. There are enough there are enough face masks and shields. In fact, I believe every teacher gets two shields. Um, uh, and there are enough face masks for everyone. Keep in mind we have 14,000 teachers. Only about um, a, a portion of those will actually be reporting for face-to-face -face instruction. I am so glad you brought that up because here is what we need to ask parents to do. If you're participating in face-to-face, -face, we really want parents to check their child's temperature at home. That is the best safeguard for children not entering uh, the school with a temperature and potentially not feeling well. We, we beg parents, please, if your child is not feeling well, 
do not let them come to school. Don't give them Tylenol and send them to school, but please keep them home. That's the first safeguard. What we have in place in our schools, uh, and we know there is conflicting or, no, there's actually pretty consistent advice from the medical community, temperature checks are not the best safeguard against COVID-19. That's, that's been stated more than once. Our medical advisory committee noted it as well. So what we have are a number of held, handheld, five handheld uh, thermometers at every school, and we've said periodically they will be checking temperatures. It's more uh, probably a, a disincentive for anyone who might erroneously or intentionally send a child who's not feeling well. Uh, periodically we're going to be checking throughout the school day, and that parent would certainly be called and asked to come and pick up their child. Here's what our medical advisors say. That is not a fail proof that will not guarantee that no one with COVID-19 is uh, coming into school because quite often they are asymptomatic and it may take a few days before they have symptoms. So what we have in our direction is periodic temperature checks both for uh, our adults and for our children in the school setting. Periodic means you don't know when we might be checking those temperatures. Number one, um, uh, request we would have of parents is please do not send your child. And if you have a thermometer at home, if you're able to check the temperature, check it before they even head out to the bus stop or before you bring them to school. We would ask that of our parents. <laughs> Sherry, you want, to, you want to play air traffic controller for me? Yeah, so PPE training actually is going out. It's supposed to go out to teachers and staff today. I want to be clear, though. So what we're not asking teachers to do is anything around a specific medical diagnosis, but how to wear a face mask, how students' face masks should be put on, uh, the face shield, the hand sanitizer, use of those wipes. That's about the limit of what we're asking our teachers to do. They, they are not supposed to be experts around PPE, but how to wear the face mask. Those who um, deal with our medically fragile children or children with special needs have gloves and gowns. All of that is being provided to those who have to use them. Very limited. Uh, uh, PPE in the classroom, but that video should be going out today, I'm told. I need my air traffic controller because I never know who started first. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you for asking for that clarification. No, we have staff, uh, some of our um, clerical staff and our administrators that will be holding, uh, dealing with those handheld thermometers. And in our clinics, we have a clinic attendant. And in the sick clinic, there will either be an LPN, if they've been hired in those schools uh, yet, who did not have them, or one of our um, substitutes who will know how to use those thermometers as well. I don't have an actual number of months for you. We, we've, we have overstocked, as um, Kevin indicated, we've overstocked. I can't tell you how many months. Keep in mind, because schools are only partially inhabited, we believe we've got enough to start the school and for the next uh, few months, but I can't tell you how many months and an exact number, and we'll continue to order. I will tell you there was a mad raid on um, uh, sanitizing wipes, that's probably the hottest commodity, but we continue to get those orders in as well. And every school, my last report says every school has their uh, preparation for the first day of school. I believe it is on the website. If not, we'll double check that. We'll make sure it's available. One last question, Sierra. Um, I have a question coming in from some parents asking about devices. We've seen them at other schools, either on the kids' desk or on the teachers' desk. Are they being used? If not, why not? 
So we are not using dividers. Uh, in fact, most of the districts around us are not using dividers in every classroom. Here's why. Uh, we believe that the teacher is still going to be up and mobile in the classroom and that the dividers are not necessary because every child is wearing a face mask. Some districts were using dividers in lieu of face mask. In other words, they said when you come in the classroom, get into your cubicle, then you can take off your face mask. We've not made that provision students will have on the face mask. We believe that is safer. So I know some of you will want to get a shot of um, some of the food provisions. Uh, I know it's getting close to lunchtime. Try not to actually consume them, but they're beautifully prepared. Uh, I want to say again, and several of you got shots of the PPE. I want to say again, uh, more information going out to teachers and staff today. We will continue to do that. We depend on uh, not just our media to communicate, but also our own um, uh, website. If you have questions, go to our website, look at our handbook, look at our frequently asked questions. Uh, we are um, uh, constantly updating those documents and uh, the new versions will appear as we receive uh, new input. Uh, for example, uh, at one time we were going to only use face shields for younger children and then CDC came out and said face shields will not replace face masks. And so we will continue to update, depend on you to help us get the word out and depend on our parents our teachers, our staff, uh, our board and administration to get the job done. We'll see you on the 21st. Chairman, I'm sorry, I thought that, I thought that was out of my peripheral vision. I thought I saw the school board chair approaching me and it was actually uh, someone else approaching me. Let me let the chairman of our school board have the last word. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. I think that was uh, mental telepathy. Um, this is good. We've been working together a year and a half, and the, and the superintendent can read my mind. Um, one thing I do want to clarify, uh, our board wants to see our schools as safe as we can possibly make them. I think I can speak for the board when I say to the extent that we can separate our students when they're in class and get them as close to that six feet distance that's recommended by, by CDC, that's what we want to see. The challenge for the superintendent is, is making that happen um, with the resources that we have. You've asked a couple of questions about how safe, or are our schools safe? I think the superintendent answered that spot on. They're, we're gonna make them as safe as we can feasibly make them. But there's no place, there's no place in the world right now that is safe if you, wanna, if you just wanna define that by the risk of COVID. We as a board also recognize that there is a substantial risk to our students who need to be in school and are not in school and those students have not been in school since February. So when we measure safety and risk, we also have to look at the risk to our students who have been away from school, who have been in isolation, who haven't, yes, they've had meal service, but no, they haven't had the environment that they need to have. We have children that come from a lot of different walks in life. And very few of us, I think, in this room can understand how much some of our children desperately need to be back in school. And that's one of the juggling and challenging issues that our board debated long and hard, was how do we balance those two risks? The risk of keeping our children out versus the risk of bringing them in and our teachers in. But all of that debate is largely mitigated by something that hasn't been discussed here, and I know you know, but I think it's important for the public to remember. We are under an emergency order. We must open all of our brick and mortar schools by the end of this month, period, end of subject. The couple of districts, um, my, uh, Palm Beach County is not doing that, but Palm Beach County is still in phase one. That means they literally are not allowed to have more than 10 people in a room at one time. It is not feasible for us to have nine students and one teacher in a, in a room at a time, and it wasn't feasible for Palm Beach County. So because they had a recommendation from their health department director, and because they're under phase one, they have a window of time that exceeds our window. Hillsborough County attempted to delay opening, and when they learned that they were gonna lose $276 million, which I would venture to say would make it impossible for them to operate their schools according to all the requirements that are placed on school districts. They backed, they, they, they reversed the course. So as we talk about our decisions, we also have to talk about them in light of what is mandated. Our schools have to open at the end of this month. And when you talk about why there isn't enough testing, what could make our schools safer? 
testing, rapid testing, would make a huge difference, not just for our schools, but our entire community. I think that question is a question to pose to Dr. Pino, and I don't mean that in a critical sense. He has resource limitations, but as we look around the state, some health departments have more resources than others. I'm no longer mayor of Orange County, so I can't tell you exactly what the resource allocation is, but I can tell you for years, Orange County Health Department was underfunded relative to our population than most others. So I think that those are questions that as active members of this community, as the media who gets to the bottom of things and often causes positive change, I would be asking those questions. Why aren't we able to get more rapid tests here for our students? Because that will make a tremendous difference. And I'm only gonna take one question because, and um, because I actually have an appointment in a few minutes, but please, go ahead. I, I think if we had um, a choice of whether or not to reopen, I, I can't speak for the whole board. I think we would have to have that debate. I suspect, based on hearing from our students and our parents that need their children back in school for a variety of reasons, we would probably still be opening our schools now. If we had the ability to have in place what we want, we would have more resources for testing. We would have more resources for teachers, paraprofessionals, so we could spread our students out. There are a number of things that we would have that we don't have. Um, but I also have to recognize that the state has taken, is taking a huge loss in revenues. We are taking a huge loss in, in local revenues. Counties are taking a huge loss in revenues. So I, I think we all have to be realistic that there is a resource problem. What I get concerned about is when one county has the ability to test and another county doesn't, those resources have to be equitably distributed so that all children, regardless of which county you're in, have the same access to those resources and all teachers do. The sooner we can identify a positive case, the sooner we can keep it from spreading. And that is extremely important to us. So, and that's not just an, uh, an Orange County problem, it's not just a Florida problem. We know it's a national problem, but we need to have our fair share here for our children, for our teachers, and for all of their families who are affected by this. Thank you for your question, and um, thank you again for being here to help us.